Thank you all for joining us for the Common Grammar Mistakes and How to Avoid Them workshop. Joining us today is Sarah Tajali from the Writing Center, so I'm going to hand it over to her to get us started. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, today we're going to do a brief overview of some common grammar mistakes that we've seen in graduate level writing um, with people that come to the Writing Center. I just want to preface by saying that um, at the Writing Center, we don't edit or proofread. We work collaboratively with people to help them maybe isolate some errors or um, or um, common errors that they might have and teach them how to revise them. Um, we're more focused on the bigger picture and bigger ideas. So um, we don't, we know that sometimes grammar doesn't get in the way of intelligibility and intelligibility is our number one priority. So um, I just wanna go over a few grammar things um, and we can discuss later in the um, workshop, um, you know, when and if, making some of these minor mistakes is going to interfere with the meaning or the message that you're trying to get across in your writing. Right. So in the workshop today, um, we're going to review some common verb tense errors, um, subject verb agreement, parallel structure. We're going to review what independent and dependent clauses are and the most common mistakes that we see with those. Um, we'll also talk briefly about pronouns when they're referring to a proper noun. We'll quickly go over some punctuation and how to use it. And then at the very end, we'll practice together, uh, correcting some sentences that have some errors in them. So first, um, let's get started with verb tenses and academic writing. So the three most common verb tenses in academic writing are simple present, simple past, and present tense. Uh, your formatting guides, depending on what you're using, might have some general rules which dictate when to use certain tenses. So um, commonly most people use APA. So you would use the present tense for implications or current conclusions, use of the simple past or present for uh, procedures, for your literature review, or when describing results. Um, if you are using MLA, maybe you write about literature. Generally, when you talk about literature, you documents are considered like living documents. So uh, people tend to use the present tense with those. So just a quick little um, review, simple present. We're using the verb research um, to research. So we use simple present when we are presenting a moment, a habit, or a trait. So they research. Simple past is a definitive point in the past that has completed, so they researched. And present perfect is an indefinite point in the past. So this is something that started in the past and is still true. So they have researched indicates that they've researched it for a long period of time, and they may still be researching um, the topic that is in the text. Okay, so some of the common verb tense errors that we see are using the present perfect when the simple past will do. So they have gone to the store yesterday. They went to the store once. It's not like they have gone to the store and they have not returned. So keep it simple. They went to the store yesterday. Um, so a lot of people, I think we use the, the present perfect a lot in our speech. They've gone. Um, They've done this, they've done that, and so we tend to overuse it in writing when we just need the simple past. Okay, um, using the past tense when the present tense is needed. So female GTAs experience disproportionate amounts of gaslighting. Unfortunately, this is not something that is done. So um, female GTAs experience, this is an ongoing thing, unfortunately, it's a habit or a fact. Um, I wish that we could speak about this in the past tense, but unfortunately we can't. Um, so you would want to use the present tense when you're talking about something that is still true or is, or is a fact. And then um, another common error we see is unnecessary shifts in tense. So researchers collected multiple samples and run them through the centrifuge. So we have 
the present or I'm sorry, past tense collected, and then we shift to the present tense when both of these should be in the past tense because these actions have already been completed. They collected them and then they ran them. Um, so watch out for these shifts in tense um, because this might affect how people process what you've been reading or what you the process of your work. Um, so keep these in mind as you go through and, and do your revisions. And if you all have any questions, um, feel free to speak up, stop me at any time or put them in the chat. I have the chat box open. All right. Um, when we cite findings from prior research, do we use past tense or present tense? I've seen both in literature via sexual research articles. Um, so that would just depend on what formatting style you're using. Um, we usually use past tense. Uh, I think I have active and passive voice in here, but if I don't, I don't believe I do, but I can review it at the end. No problem. Okay. Um, subject verb agreement. So a verb tense must agree with this subject. So this can get a little bit tricky sometimes um, because we, in, as you as graduate writers, use a lot of maybe prepositional phrases to describe your work or your subject. And sometimes that might get a little bit confusing or we tend to not know whether a verb is uh, singular or plural depending on how it's used. So. The errors that we sometimes see is um, literature is an interesting subject. So is would be the correct verb because literature, even though it encompasses so much and it's um, a big word, it still is a singular subject. Um, two thirds of the students are commuters. So students is the uh, subject. So the verb are would be the correct verb. So what tends to get confusing is when a prepositional phrase comes between the subject and the verb, like I said before. The analysis of the results reveal a significant difference between the groups. So sometimes we'll look at this and we'll think that the results is the, ver the subject, but actually the subject is the analysis itself. So you would want to use reveals instead of reveal. So the analysis of the results reveals a significant difference between the two groups. And, you know, when we're saying it out loud, sometimes our, our brains, you know, we, we see results and so it sounds correct, right? So if you're ever unsure about this, just take out that modifier, take out that um, prepositional phrase that is describing your subject to isolate what the correct verb is. Okay, any questions on uh, tenses or subject and verb agreement? Right, um, so we're briefly going to talk about parallel structure. So par parallel structure is when you use a consistent pattern of words to link several ideas, examples, or parts. Um, the reason that we use parallel structure, and like I said, it it's not really going to interfere with intelligibility if you don't always use this, but having this sort of consistency in whether the verbs are all plural or, um, sorry, the verbs are all um, the same tense or you're using adjectives plus a noun, these sort of structures help people process what you're saying. And this is something that we're used to doing in our, um, in our verbal speech. So I think that this is not something that we think about very often when we're writing, but sometimes we do see these errors and they, they sometimes get in the way of kind of processing what the writer is trying to say. So for example, before the barbecue, you should buy some steaks, have prepared a marinade, wrap the potatoes in foil and ignite the charcoal. So we have a few different verbs here. Um, a few different tenses that, and you can understand what this sentence is saying, but our brains like the, before the barbecue, you should buy some steaks, prepare a marinade, wrap the potatoes in foil and ignite the charcoal. So having that consistency, consistency in your verbs makes it a lot easier for your audience to process what you're trying to say when you have these uh, lists of items. Okay, so let's quickly um, go over independent and dependent clauses. 
So an independent clause contains a subject and a verb and is a complete thought, so it can stand alone. Um, a dependent clause also contains a subject and a verb, but it's an incomplete thought or idea and it cannot stand alone. So um, just by simply adding a word to an independent clause, we can make it a dependent clause. Um, so we're going to go over that a little bit. I think that's something that as we're writing, you know, we tend to put punctuation in certain places that break these independent and dependent clauses up and that could kind of get in the way of intelligibility. So I'm going to go over some common errors that we see uh, related to these two definitions. And if you all have questions, just let me know. Okay. So um, independent clauses. So we study the effects of cell phones on romantic relationships. So that is a, com a complete thought. Um, it was made dependent when we added the word when. So when we study the effect of cell phones on romantic relationships. Okay, when you did that, what happened? So as you can see, um, we've made these into full sentences using that dependent marker. So when we studied the effect of cell phones on romantic relationships, we looked at the work of Garcia and Midland. And then the second example is when we put the dependent clause first. When we looked at the work of Garcia and Midland, we looked at the work of Garcia and Midland when we studied the effects of cell phones on romantic relationships. So you can either put the dependent clause or independent clause in whichever order you want. The only difference is that when you put the um, dependent clause first, you're going to have a comma in between clauses. So the first one, when we study the effects of cell phones on romantic relationships, the dependent clause came first. So that's why we have the comma. We didn't change any wording. We just changed the order of the clauses in the second example, and there's no comma to break up the two clauses. And there's the rule. And this PowerPoint is also up on Canvas if you all need to refer to it. Okay, so fragments. A uh, fragmented sentence is an incomplete sentence that doesn't have a subject or a verb, or it could be a dependent clause without an independent clause. So because the results were inconclusive is a fragment, okay? Um, what Because the results were inconclusive, what happened? It's unclear um, and we're, you know, sometimes people tend to offset this information with the wrong type of punctuation and the audience gets a little bit lost. So to fix this, um, we have to have a subject. The experiment was halted because the results were inconclusive. So when you go through, you know, if you have a full stop, if you have a period, um, kind of look at these fragments or look at these sentences, these, especially these shorter ones, um, and look to see, do I have a subject? Do I have a verb? Can this sentence stand on its own? Okay. Or you can flip it around to um, because the results were inconclusive, the experiment was halted. So again, you can see when the dependent clause comes first, that comma is going to come after the clause, and then the uh, independent clause will come next. Okay. So again, um, like I said before, it usually these fragments are caused by misplaced period, um, which separates the dependent clause from the independent clause. Our lab published five papers this year is a full sentence, independent clause, it has a subject and a verb, which made this our most productive year ever. So to which made this our most productive year ever is not a complete sentence. Um, so you would just add a comma to link those two ideas because which made this our most productive year ever modifies the independent clause. Okay, any questions on that? And I know I'm going kind of quick, but we'll review this at the end as well. Okay, um, so now we'll talk about pronoun referent confusion. So to break up our writing, sometimes we'll use pronouns um, so we're not complete, con continuously repeating names or proper nouns um, or other nouns, but you wanna make sure that it's clear to your reader who or what the pronoun is referring to. So we'll take a look at some examples. 
So Anna told Megan that she likes her new bike. Who is her? Is it Anna or is it Megan? It's not clear, right? So this is a time where it could be confusing to your reader. Um, so you want to say, Anna told Megan that she likes Megan's new bike, or Anna told Megan that she likes Anna's new bike, so the reader can follow along. Uh, let's look at the next example. In Hollywood, they don't know what the American public really wants to see. So who is they? Um, if this is coming at the beginning of a sentence or beginning of a paragraph, your reader's definitely going to be um, confused. So make sure that it's clear that they is referring to something so your reader knows what you're talking about. I think when we are so ingrained in our subjects and in our writing, sometimes we we know who they is and we for, we lose sight of who our audience is. So make sure that when you're using these pronouns, uh, the reader can follow along. Uh, let's take a look at another example. Uh, the story examines their chance encounter and developing friendship. Ultimately, it tells the story of how Pedro and Janice became friends. So, although we know that this is referring to Pedro and Janice now, when we read this first sentence, I'm unsure who there is referring to. So, if you're going to use a pronoun, um, make sure that it comes after you've introduced your subject. So I would flip this around. The story examines Pedro and, and Janice's chance encounter, ultimately tells the story of how they became friends. So then it's clear who the pronoun is referring to. Um, I tend to see this a lot when people are starting a new paragraph. Um, so they'll use pronouns in their topic sentence. You wanna reintroduce your subject or what you're speaking about when you start a new paragraph, just because Again, it's unclear. The reader thinks you're starting a new topic or starting a new subject. And so if you just throw a pronoun in there at the beginning, they might be lost. So be sure to um, make sure that it's clear to your reader that they know who the pronouns are referring to. All right, any questions on that? Okay, so um, we're gonna go through punctuation really quick. Um, I'm sure you've heard punctuation marks are like traffic signs. They help guide your reader. Um, some of them are mandatory, but many are optional. So some punctuation, like you can see here, I used an M dash, which we'll talk about. Um, they just enhance clarity or meaning. Pronouns are being observed in writing, right? Uh, yeah, and I know this is a lot to, to say about pronouns um, using you know, gender specific pronouns or personal pronouns. Um, that's not necessarily what I was referring to. Um, thankfully, a lot of the, the formatting guidelines like APA and MLA are now um, embracing the gender neutral pronouns, like they and their, um, and I'm all for using those. But in my previous example, that's just more of like, what are those referring to? So it could be an it. Um, it could be, it doesn't necessarily have to be a person. Those pronouns could be a, an object pronoun. Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify. Okay, um, so let's continue with punctuation. Um, so like I said, some are optional. They can enhance clarity or meaning. Some are a stylistic choice um, and some you can substitute for others. So um, this clause, for example, could easily be separated by a colon, a semicolon, or even parentheses. So we'll go over the different functions of that in just a moment. Okay, so comma splice. Um, so I'm sure you all heard about comma splices and um, it took me a while to you know, learn what these were, um, but it's placing a comma between two independent clauses. So you have two complete sentences and instead of separating them with a period, or um, some other conjunction, you just put a comma in between. So many graduate students frequent the writing center. That's an independent clause. This helps them with their writing, another independent clause, but we have a comma splice because we have a comma there instead of a period. So with comma splices, the period isn't the only type of uh, revision you can make. Um, you can also, add a different um, word to make the 
second independent clause a dependent clause and keep that comma, which helps them with their writing. Now, the second uh, clause is dependent, so you can separate it with a comma and avoid the comma splice. Um, you can also do a semicolon. So semicolon, we'll talk about a little bit later, but it basically is two related sentences, um, two complete independent clauses that are just separated by a semicolon as opposed to a period. Okay. Another way to fix comma splices um, and another way to use commas is with independent clauses and coordinating conjunctions. So we use a comma and a coordinating conjunction. The acronym we use is FANBOYS, which is for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. So we include, we use a comma and one of these conjunctions to link these two independent clauses. And the conjunction you use just depends on the relationship of these two sentences. So, for example, uh, the professor instructed the students to read the next chapter, but the students ignored him. So, um, we see that those two independent clauses, the professor instructed the students and the students ignored him. Those are two um, independent clauses, but by adding that comma and the coordinating conjunction, then we avoid the comma splice. Okay, and then we have it here as well. The bears did not seem interested in the hikers, comma, nor did they get out of the water. So that's just another way that you can fix a comma splice. Um, we also use commas with introductory elements. So we just use a comma to set off the, it could be a single word, a phrase, or a dependent clause like we spoke about before. So, for example, C, comma, the answer is not that complicated. So, you can use it, like I said, for a single word or phrase. At the conclusion of their conversation, comma, the students and the instructors both left the classroom. So, commas are used to separate clauses, but they're also used to um, offset introductory elements as well. Okay, and then I think most of you are familiar with using commas in a series. Um, we use them to separate words or phrases. Um, for example, students must register for classes, comma, move into the dorms, comma, and buy their books before the semester begins. Um, include a comma before the conjunction, which is called the Oxford comma. I know some people, they think this is unnecessary. They've been told not to use the Oxford comma. Um, the only discipline that I know that this might be true in is journalism or any discipline that uses AP style because they are more aware of the, the spacing when they're publishing. But I encourage you to use the Oxford comma because it could interfere with the meaning of what you're trying to say. So, for example, Jane enjoys cooking, comma, her family, comma, and her dog. If you were to eliminate that Oxford comma, Jane enjoys cooking, comma, her family and her dog, that would indicate that she enjoys cooking people and her pet, right? Not that she enjoys these three items separately. So, I encourage you to use the Oxford comma. Okay, any questions on commas before we move on to the next type of punctuation? Okay, um, so let's briefly talk about semicolons. Um, these are used to separate two independent clauses that are not joined by a conjunction. So, for example, uh, Louise Erdrich is Ojibwe and German, is of Ojibwe and German descent semicolon, she writes about both heritages in her novel. So these are two independent clauses that are closely related. So, and semicolons, you know, I think a lot of people aren't sure when to use them. If you don't feel comfortable using them, don't use them. I mean, it is, it can be a stylistic choice. It's not an error if you use a period instead of a semicolon, but that's when they're used. It's kind of like a slight pause. If you think of a period as a full stop and if you think of a comma as a yield um, and how you want your reader to process, you know, the, the pace of how they're reading it, 
you could use a semicolon if you just want them to kind of take like a slight pause um, before they read the next related idea. So that's just one way of using the semicolon. Um, we also use it when we start with a conjunctive adverb or a transitional phrase. So um, we'll stick with Louise Erdrich. Uh, Ojibwe author Louise Erdrich allowed Henry Louis Gates to research her genealogy for his television show. Semicolon, however, comma, she would not let him analyze her DNA. So you would use a semicolon when you have these conjunctive adverbs. So however, nevertheless, although um, to give your reader a bit of a pause before you move on to the next. And again, you don't have to use a semicolon. You can use a period in place of the semicolon, but this is just another way to use this type of punctuation if you weren't sure. Okay, and finally, um, you can also use a semicolon instead of commas to separate items in a series if the items contain internal commas. And using the semicolon again is a stylistic choice, but it does make things a bit clearer for your audience, especially when you have so many commas in these long lists. So um, just to give you an example, classic science fiction sagas are Star Trek, comma, with Dr. Spock. Then we have the semicolon, Battlestar Galactica, comma, with its Cylon Raiders, semicolon, and Star Wars, comma, with Han Solo, comma, Luke Skywalker, comma, and Darth Vader. So, like I said before, those semicolons could be substituted for commas, but instead having the semicolon groups the uh, different pieces of information in a way that's more digestible. So we know clearly that Star that Spock is a part of Star Trek, Cylons are a part of Battlestar Galactica, and Han and Luke and Darth Vader are part of Star Wars, just by having that different punctuation. But again, these are not a requirement. This is just another way of using this type of punctuation mark. Any questions on semicolons? Okay. Now we're gonna to go to colons. Um, colons are used to join an independent clause with directly related clauses or phrases. Uh, if you wanna think about how to use a colon, think of it as a substitute for thus or as follows. Um, just keep in mind that everything before the colon should be an independent clause. Um, the professor's actions were within the guidelines of the department policy that is a independent clause. It can stand on its own. Then the comma comes next, or colon comes next. Colon, they were justified, lawful, and proper. The first letter post colon can be either capitalized or lowercase. That is also a choice that you can make or you can refer to your formatting guides, but as far as I know, it can begin with a lowercase or capital letter in both MLA and APA formatting, and CMS, I think, as well. Okay, and we also use colons to introduce a list or statement. Puppy therapy is useful for various groups, colon, college students, sick children, and the elderly. So just keep in mind that the phrase or the clause before the colon needs to be an independent clause. Any questions on colons? Okay. All right, so now we're just gonna briefly talk about M and N dashes. Um, M dash is a little bit longer than a hyphen and I know it might be difficult to tell um, up at the top in the bolded text next to m dash is an m dash next to n dash is an n dash so you can see that they are slightly different in size um an m dash is a little bit longer than a hyphen and it's used to offset information like a comma or a parentheses it is a stylistic choice some people like to use them for emphasis um so for example on our vacation m dash which was long overdue m dash we visited three different countries um, so just think of these, like I said before, as a comma or a parentheses if you really want to stress or emphasize some information. But again, 
it's up to you. These are completely a stylistic choice. I know a lot of people that don't use any of these in their writing and you know, don't be intimidated by that. Um, the end dash it signifies a range and these are, that's a little bit longer than a hyphen. So here we see, I work 315 to 1015 PM. So we try to use the end dash to signify that range. Most of the time people have a hyphen here because it's easier to create on a keyboard. It doesn't interfere with the eligibility, it, not eligibility, intelligibility. People understand if there's a hyphen that you're trying to indicate a range. Um, as far as creating these two different types of punctuation, it depends on your um, processor. I don't know the keyboard shortcuts to this off the top of my head, but if anybody's interested afterwards, I can look them up for you. Um, but again, these are just a personal choice on whether you want to use this type of punctuation. Some people like the way that it looks when people are looking at the page. So it all depends on your style. Okay. And finally, quotation marks. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with using quotation marks and citing information. Um, I just want to talk briefly about a question that we normally get about quotation marks and um, periods and commas. So you always wanna place your periods and commas inside the quotation marks. Um, so for example, um, this is a stick up comma, said the bank robber, I want all your money. Um, so you can see, I know, I'm not sure it's in red, but the commas and periods are inside um, the quotation marks on the first example. And the next one, the bank robber said, comma, quote, this is a stick up. So um, you wanna try and put those, if it's part of the quote within the punctuation marks, um, colons and semicolons are gonna go outside quotation marks. And so are questions and exclamation points, unless it is part of the quote itself. So if that piece of punctuation was within the text, that you're quoting, you'll leave those um, punctuation marks within the print or the quotation marks. But if it's not, it's something like you're questioning something, um, then you'll put that on the outside. And for both of our, um, for MLA and APA in-text citations, the handouts that we have, um, that's one of the first things that we have up on the handout is reminding people where to put the different types of punctuation when it comes to quotations. Um, and then I have an example down here um, with Louise uh, Erdrich again, where we have a quote from um, her, Michael, the story comes up different every time and has no ending, but always begins with you, end quote. And then we have the semicolon outside of the quotation marks before we introduce the next idea. So, um, that's just a very brief how to use quotation marks and other punctuation. Okay, any questions? All right, so now we're going to practice together. Um, so all of these may or may not have an error in the subject verb agreement and we'll go through these one by one you can put your answer in the chat box if you want or if you're feeling brave you can unmute and uh, say it out loud for everybody so um, we can do these together to get some practice in so the first one the review of the major works in the respective field were time consuming so is this sentence okay see some no's, okay? So what would we change to make the subject and verb agree? Or what is the subject? Okay, we could change it to the reviews, but maybe we just had one review of it, right? The review was. So the review is our subject, not major works. Um, so the review was time consuming. So you wanna make sure to identify the subject so you can see whether or not your verb agrees. All right, what about the second one? The relevant articles in the field was examined to conduct the literature review. All right, I see some answers. So were, 
the relevant articles in the field were examined to conduct the literature review. So articles in this case is our subject. Relevant just describes the articles. So that's just an adjective describing it. Um, so we would use were. All right. And what about the last one? The results of the initial analysis was to continue working while attempting to correct known problems. Look good. Okay. So, in this example, results is our subject. The initial analysis just describes the results. So, I think as we're speaking, when we're talking real quick, we might just say was instead of were because the last word we say is analysis and we assume that that's the subject. The results, of, so the results is actually our subject here. The results were to continue working while attempting to correct known problems. Okay, let's move on to sentence fragments. So we placed the participants into two groups, a control group and an experimental group, which was essential in order to measure the results of our intervention. So is there anything wrong with this first sentence? And if so, how do we fix it? comma before which, thank you. And that's because which was essential in order to measure the results of our intervention is a dependent clause. So you want to make sure that it's connected with a comma instead of a period, or else you have a sentence fragment just dangling at the end of that thought. All right, what about the next one? The research covered various aspects of energy. For example, solar, wind, and water. Is this okay? Do both sentences have a subject and a verb? No, they don't. For example, solar, wind, and water, that we're missing a verb there. So there's two ways that we can connect these uh, clauses. Either you can get rid of the example the for example and put a colon because the research covered various aspects of energy is an independent clause. It can stand alone and then that colon can just introduce us into the list or change that period to a comma. All right, and now we just have a couple more to do together. So um, punctuation, the results of the hypothesis were surprising, comma, they disproved our hypothesis entirely. So what is the error here and how can we fix it? Okay, so one option is to put a semicolon before they. Anything else, any other suggestions? All shy. That's okay. So we have two independent clauses here separated by a comma, which makes it a comma splice. And the beauty of these is there's so many ways to fix them. So um, here you can see there's a semicolon in the last example. We can also just change that comma to a period, or we can add a coordinating conjunction, uh, like in the first example. The results of the hypothesis were surprising, comma, but they disproved our hypothesis entirely. All right, what about the next one? The students wanted to keep refining the methods, but the professor wanted them to move on to other matters. Comma before but, yeah. Otherwise we have a run on sentence. Um, so when we have those coordinating conjunctions that Connect those two independent clauses. We want to have that comma as well. Okay. Um, and then the final one award winning films and their directors include The Hurt Locker, directed by Catherine Bigelow, No Country for Old Men, directed by Joel and Ethan Cohen, and Life of Pi, directed by Ang Lee. Is this okay as it is?
No. Yes, but it's difficult. So, yes, it is okay as it is. It is a little bit difficult to read. Um, so, you do have the option of putting those semicolons in there to break up the information. The hurt locker, comma, directed by Catherine Bigelow, semicolon, and so on. So, although the example is correct, uh, having that semicolon offers your reader a little bit more clarity and lets them compartmentalize things a little bit easier. All right, last one. Smith and Jones and Swenson and Harmon both study this effect. They found it to be pervasive among high school students, while Swenson and Harmon found it most pervasive among that population as well as middle school students. So, who is they referring to? It's a little bit unclear when the they comes first, right? As you keep reading, you see, okay, well, if Swenson and Harmon found this, they must be Smith and Jones, but why make your reader wonder, right? Um, I would just use, when you're talking about two different groups, just repeat the proper nouns again when possible. But when I read that they immediately, I'm like, who, wait, who's they, did I miss something? Because that initial pronoun, there's two different groups. So I'm not sure who it is referring to. And my brain gets a little bit lost before I can even finish the rest of the sentence. So that's why that's just another example. It's why it's important to have those pronoun reference be clear. All right. Any questions for me? Or anything else you all want me to go over? I know somebody asked about um, passive and active voice, um, which I'd be happy to help you with. But any other questions about any of the stuff we went over today as far as punctuation or grammar? Okay. Let me actually, I'm going to pull up. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a moment and I'm going to pull up a visual aid to kind of help me with passive and active. So just one moment. Um, I know something that a lot of people hear um to never use the passive voice which is not true um so let me just find our handout on it and i can go over it all of you together i also do have a list of transitional phrases so um let me share my screen again Um, so, before I go over active and passive, here on the Writing Center website, which is writingcenter.unlv.edu, we have this writing resources tab, and we have lots of handouts, and we have um, some workshops, we even have some videos, and we're adding new videos every day if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, but we have a list of transitions available. Um, if you're not sure where it could be grouped, we have a, an A to Z handout list and transitions is one of the options on here. Okay, let me just pull the chat back up again. All right, so active and passive voice. Let me see, I know I had a specific question. John Smith study finds or found. Okay, John Smith study finds or found. Um, so it just depends on which one is what what sort of tense you're using or how you're speaking about the text or the formatting that you're using. Um, I might use found depending on the context in which I'm writing. So the, the tense is going to be um, dependent on the context and what your guidelines uh, say. So if you're using APA, I as I said at the beginning of 
this um, APA wants present tense for implications and current conclusions, simple past um, or present perfect for procedures and simple past tense when describing results. So since this would be describing results of John Smith, it might be John Smith's study found, blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right, so now active and passive voice. Um, so active and passive voice is, we use it depending on how important, to simplify things, how important the agent is. So the agent is the person that's doing the action. Um, I think a lot of people discourage writers from using the passive voice because it's sometimes overly complicated. Um, and it's easier to just say, this person did this, but the passive voice is everywhere. So for example, if you go into any building, you can see smoking is prohibited. Who is it prohibited by? It doesn't matter. The emphasis is more on the action than who's doing the prohibiting. So we could turn that around and say, this, the building management prohibits smoking. So that would turn it into an active voice because the subject or the person that's doing the action is coming first. And then what they want you to do, like the action itself is not as important as the agent that's performing the action. So in active voice, it's usually subject, verb, object. In passive voice, we flip those around. So the, you know, the subject is a receiver of the action um, rather than the doer. So um, here's a side by side. We cook dinner is active. Dinner is cooked by us. So that's why, you know, a lot of times people are going to discourage using the passive voice, dinner is cooked by us. Why would we say that? You wanna just be active. We cook dinner, this is what we do. It's much, much easier to say, but sometimes in science writing, it's not important who does the doing. Um, you just, and maybe you might not even know. So you'll want to use the passive voice. So the study was conducted by or if you want to not use first person pronouns, a lot of times we do use that passive voice. The results were found to be so. Um, that's the main difference. Um, to form the act, the passive voice, we have a little bit of a, a converting thing. So um, the passive voice, you're going to use the um, perfect, um, the past participle past participle of the word. Um, so as you can see here, we were, we have cooked dinner, turn dinner has been cooked by us. So you're going to, the, the tense is gonna say the same, but instead of using um, the past tense of the verb or the present tense of the verb, you're gonna use the um, past participle, which is kind of confusing. Cooked is the same in the past as it is in the, um, using the past participle. So let me think of another verb. Um, that we can use. Are y'all following me so far? <laughs> okay. Um, let's actually look at the examples here. That might be a little bit easier. Um, so the, let's look at these passive sentences. So this building was constructed in 2015. Um, so it's not important who constructed it. We just want to know that the building was constructed if we want to turn this back into active voice, we would say construction workers constructed this building in 2015. So we're going to get rid of that past participle with the was or has been, and we're just going to use the base, um, the base uh, form of the, the verb. Um, in the United States, most oranges are grown in Florida. So again, this is just a fact who's growing the oranges may not be important to the context of this. If we wanted to flip, flip it around, orange farmers grow oranges in Florida. So um, instead of are grown, 
we would change it to the simple present tense because this is a fact um, instead of having it using the, the past participle, which is grown. Um, and then the next one, my car was made in America by who, right? So Americans made my car in America is how we would make that active. So again, the active is more emphasis on who's doing the work um, and the passive is more on the work that's being done. So um, if you wanna think about it in that context and this um, handout is available on our website if you wanna to refer to it, but that's just the main difference. Um, there is a little formula on how to um, convert active to passive on here as well. Yes, this handout is on the website. I can actually just link it in the chat real quick. And I will also um, link everybody to our resources as well. And I know we also have, I should have pulled up the workshop. Um, we also have a workshop on active and, and passive voice. Um, it's the writing with style workshop here. Um, or the grammar refresher, I'll have to look it up and I, I could have gone through that. Um, but that has more information on active and passive voice and how to convert the two. Any other questions? Oh, list of transitional phrases. Let me find that for you. Here is a handout with a list of transitions and the function of each of them. So if you're ever stuck on that. Any other questions for me? Anything else? We just have a couple minutes left and I know the next is the revising workshop, but if there's anything else for me, um, feel free to let me know or you can reach out to the writing center. We're happy to answer quick questions as well. Um, I'll go ahead and put the email in the chat and if you ever have a quick question that you want to send our way and we could answer it in 10 minutes or less we'd be happy to do that via email too awesome thank you so much sarah thank you